When I say the words, women in the Middle East, what are you thinking about? I know you've read the headlines, so I'm guessing that you've got some images in your mind that are a little bit grim. Maybe it's a Saudi woman thrown in jail for daring to drive, or a young 10-year-old girl from Yemen married off to a much older man against her will. Or perhaps it's the courageous Egyptian activist subjected to unspeakable sexual violence in an effort to intimidate them and silence them. But let me give you some other things to consider. Women in the Middle East today, as in other parts of the world, now outnumber men at university. And in some countries by a lot, in Bahrain, Qatar, the UAE, fully 65% of university graduates are women. Even in conservative Saudi Arabia, 60% of graduates are women. The Middle East is the only part of the world where women in, this, in school both outnumber and outperform men in the STEM subjects of science, technology, engineering, and math. Women make up the majority of graduates in the sciences, and in some cases, by a lot. In the life sciences, more than 70% of graduates in the Middle East are women. So the point is that in addition to the political revolutions taking place across the region that you've no doubt read about, there's another revolution going on, a quieter, but I would argue no less important revolution, and this one is led by women. Women are not only closing the gender gaps in education, but they're having fewer children, they're entering the workforce in larger numbers, and they're increasingly demanding their rights. The right to study what they want, to work where they want, their rights in the family. This is not a new movement. It has been decades in the making. But it's got a new sense of urgency today because it is taking place against a backdrop of acute political transition from Tunisia to Libya to Egypt to Yemen all across the region. And as new constitutions are written, new governments are formed, it's a time of opportunity for women. But it's also a time of peril. Revolutions have a tendency to use women as street fodder and to spit them out at the end. But all across the Middle East, there are millions of women determined to write a new story. Women like Tawakal Karman, who's often referred to as the mother of Yemen's revolution. I was in Yemen in early 2011. I was there doing research on a new book on education in the Middle East. And one day my translator said to me, do you want to meet an incredible woman? She's holding protests down at the university. She says she's not going to stop until she forces the president of Yemen to step down. And I thought to myself, well, the president of Yemen had been in power at this point for more than 30 years. So whatever she was doing was either completely crazy or history making. So I said, sure, let's go. And when I got down there, it wasn't hard for me to find her. There were hundreds and hundreds of men protesting in front of the university. And there she was in front of them all, the lone woman in her flowered headscarf, leading the charge, leading the protests with incredible courage and energy and dedication. She very graciously invited me back to her home for coffee that afternoon, and as we sat there chatting with her beautiful children running in and out of the room, she said to me, I will not give up. I will stick at this every single day until I can bring greater democracy and human rights to my country. I know this could land me in prison, she said, or I could end up dead, but I don't care. I want a better country for my children. I'm determined. And in fact, her determination was so palpable, her words so powerful, I knew I was in the presence of someone remarkable. And indeed, I was. Of course, she went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize later that year, the youngest winner of the Nobel Peace Prize ever. But across the Middle East, there are many, many women who have that courage and determination. In Egypt, women have organized 
in all sorts of new ways organize new organizations, they're using film, they're using social media, all sorts of things to fight back against the pervasive problem of sexual violence. In Tunisia, at the start of their revolution, women came together and demanded a seat at the political table. As the new government was being formed, they pushed for and got a law that required parties to alternate men and women on their party lists. And through this process, they were able to get 27% of the seats in the new parliament. Women in Libya did something similar, using this zippered list system, and got 17% of the seats. And this compares to, in the United States, women still have fewer than 20% of the seats in Congress. Several years ago, I wrote a book about some of these remarkable women transforming the Middle East. The reaction from American readers was often incredulous, and they'd say to me, how did you find these women? As if I were finding needles in a haystack. But of course, my challenge was not finding these women, it was simply choosing which women to write about, whose stories to tell. The women who are working on this broader rights agenda in the Middle East, they are working for change in a way that they really place absolutely firmly in the center of a much larger struggle, a much larger push for greater re freedom, greater rights, and greater democracy. And their ability to succeed will really be a litmus test for how well these revolutions deliver on the expectation and the promise of greater freedom. If the revolutions can deliver on women's rights, they're for, far more likely to deliver on the core rights un underpinning democracy, including freedom of speech and freedom of religion. But it won't be easy. Let's remember, it's never been easy. Women in the United States struggled for more than 70 years just to get the right to vote. And along the way, they were labeled labeled as anti-family, labeled as anti-Christian, labeled as communists. Women in the Middle East have similarly been labeled, labeled as anti-family, labeled as slavish followers of some illegitimate Western agenda, and labeled as anti-Islamic. They absolutely reject those labels, and they see what they're doing as core to the broader struggle for freedom, rights, democracy. And they also see what they're doing as not inconsistent with Islam. Early Islam, in many ways, was groundbreaking for women. It gave women many unprecedented rights, like the right to inheritance, which in the West, in many countries, women didn't firmly get that right until well into the 20th century. But over the years, those rights were lost in many cases, buried under conservative traditions, rigid, fundamentalist interpretation. Women today are rereading the text for themselves, and they are finding in those texts an Islamic justification for their human rights agenda. Why is this important? Well, in many of the countries in the Middle East, majorities of people in some cases, vast majorities, 85, 90% of the population say they want to live in a system based on Islamic law, based on Sharia. So finding a way to reconcile a modern role for women with Sharia is an important battleground that women recognize. And they're making some progress. In Morocco, women worked with religious leaders to reform the all-important family law and they scored some significant legal gains with a more holistic, more progressive reading of the text, the religious leaders agreed to a lot of changes that improved the legal situation for women, such as raising the marriage age to 18, giving women full divorce rights, and also effectively banning polygamy. In Egypt, women have been working with the head of one of the leading Islamic institutions, Al-Azhar, to reiterate 
again, women's rights in Islam. And they just published a document, again, affirming women's rights in Islam. And why is this important in Egypt? Because in Egypt's turbulence, its political turmoil, there are religious conservatives using Islam, using religion as a tool to strip women of their rights, to push women backwards. At stake is not only the writing of new constitutions, constitutions that are going to set legal precedent for years to come, but attitudes towards women's rights have profound economic implications. And let's not forget that the revolutions in the Middle East were about more than just freedom. It's about economic opportunity for everyone. And the reality is that even though women outnumber men at the university level in the Middle East, they still have the lowest workforce participation rates of women in any region in the world. And that creates a huge economic challenge for that part of the world. The International Labor Organization estimates that if the economies in the Middle East could simply reduce their gender gap in workforce participation rates by half, that they would be able to grow their uh, economies by an additional two percentage points a year to boost GDP rates by two full points. That's enormous. Across the Middle East, there are religious conservatives who are trying to push women backwards, trying to push them back into the Middle Ages. But the revolutions have not only unleashed conservative forces, they have also unleashed an unprecedented mobilization of women. Women are moving forward. This is a genie that is out of the bottle, and it's not going back in. And if anything, I think the pace of change is only going to accelerate for a variety of reasons. The first is education. With more women graduating from university than men, earning degrees in sciences and all sorts of fields, and breaking ground as leaders, business leaders, architects, doctors, lawyers, you name it, the lived reality of their lives is simply going in an opposite direction from that fundamentalist vision of women. The second reason is technology. Women are using technology to expose injustice. They're using technology to promote change. They're using technology to shape the narrative. Today in Saudi Arabia, women are uploading every day videos of themselves driving <laughs> to YouTube every day. They're really just thumbing their noses at the authorities against the ban on women driving. And in many of these videos, if you go and look at them, they have proud husbands, fathers, brothers sitting next to them, encouraging them, bring it on. This is change that can't be stopped. The third reason is transnational movements. Women are organizing and learning from each other, learning how to marshal arguments, their economic influence, international law, religious arguments to push their case. I know that there are many different paths to empowerment. There's no one way. There are many paths that end up in different places, which is fine. But one thing I do know for sure is that the struggle for women's rights in the Middle East today is not a sideshow. It is absolutely central it is central to the struggle against extremism. It is central to the quest for greater rights and freedom. And it is absolutely critical to meet the aspiration of greater economic opportunities for everyone. Thank you.